Welcome, fellow travelers, to another interview uh, in the series of season two interviews here at Fate's Wide Wheel. Of course, I'm your host, Sam, and I am joined this week by the writer of Off the Cuff and producer for Quantum Leap, and that is none other than Alex Berger. Alex, thank you so much for being here. No, thank you so much, Sam. Obviously, uh, a huge fan of the podcast and uh, really enjoyed our first chat last year. Can't wait to talk about this one. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, it's exciting uh, the you know the the placement for this episode because it's the first episode back after the the lengthy break. But even more so, it's the first episode back after the strike. Because uh, mm -hmm. obviously, those first eight were filmed prior to that. So I would love to hear a little bit about just that kind of process we've talked a lot about um you know with with other writers and i'd love to get your insight on this too um going directly from season one to season two i mean literally still being in kind of like post-production on season one while starting season two even um so can you talk a little bit about just the the frame of mind everyone was in coming back after the strike and getting started on, on this i know obviously there was some story stuff set up but it, it had to feel different coming back after a long break yeah, that's a great question. So when we when we came back for season two, we sort of anticipated the possibility of a strike. And so when Martin and Dean built the production schedule, they always built it so that we could for sure have eight episodes in the bank so that, you know, depending on how long the strike went, we would be able to, to air those. And then story-wise build to a hiatus, production-wise build to a hiatus, writers who would build to a hiatus, even if there hadn't been a strike. But if there were a strike, it was kind of a natural pause point. Um, we had actually completely broken the season. We had um, fully broken 12 out of 13, and then 13 was sort of halfway through when the strike happened, and then everybody was pencils down and, and sort of, you know, obviously doing our, our duty to, to support the strike. And then when we came back, it was actually, um, you know, sort of a blessing in disguise, being able to kind of look back at the final five episodes with a little bit more of a 30,000 foot view, you know, when you're in a production especially the way we did it with, with no gap between season one and two. It's just you're building a train track in front of a train. And to be able to have that pause and look back and say, okay, what choices did we make in these final five that we really want to um, rethink? You know, we all had now the, the benefit of watching the first eight cuts and seeing, um, you know, what parts of the show were working and what parts of the show maybe needed a little bit of clarification. Um, and so it was a nice kind of pause. And then, you know, I was able to, I had started uh, writing 209 before the strike. I was able to quickly finish it and sort of get that off and going because we were pretty quickly into production on that. But, you know, we were able to sort of, um, I think the second look on that second half of the season was really helpful for us. Mm. Yeah, I can, I can imagine, uh, especially I'm curious how much of the sort of the, the fan reaction, um, and, you know, anything that you might've been hearing, um, from, you know, viewing numbers, et cetera, if that influenced anything, not necessarily like story changes, but might've just influenced even the excitement, because I feel like the first, you know, part of season two did generate a lot of excitement, uh, among fans. And I know that the ratings were, were a bit up as well. So I'm just curious if any of that kind of influenced the, the vibe coming back. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, at the, <clears throat> NBC had done some studies on the show, primarily based on season one, and I think maybe the first couple of episodes of season two, and sort of studying, you know, focus grouping what the audience was liking and what they were responding less to. And in a lot of ways, it was a validation of the types of things that we were leaning into with the show. It was they love the leaps, they love the characters, you know, they love the ongoing stories that feel like they're emotional and propulsive. So I think we were sort of spot on on that, but it did help us lean into the tone of the show, you know, that, that people were responding to. I know, especially with 209, I think people were really responding to the fun action adventure elements of the show. It was already the story we had planned. Like we, we had, we had always wanted to do this sort of, um, you know, midnight run homage, which we could talk a little bit more about later, you know, kind of fun totally. action adventure thing, but it was kind of a good validation of, okay, those are the types of stories we should be doing and looking forward to 10 through 13. Let's make sure we're leaning into the higher stakes, you know, propulsive uh, adventures that that can go on. Yeah, um, I, I mean, that's a perfect opportunity to jump into off the cuff a little bit, because one of the things that I really enjoyed about the episode uh, was that tone, you know, was the was the sense of humor, um, you know, while also not sacrificing any of that, that that tension and sort of the propulsive nature of just being on the run and, and, and the chase aspects. I mean, we, we get a literal car chase in the episode, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Um, can you talk a little bit about like, you know, in, in breaking the episode and talking about kind of setting things up and you mentioned Midnight Run, I, I also kind of like couldn't help because it's a TV show. Think of like other television shows where you might get a similar vibe at times, like something even like Rockford Files or uh, uh, Fall Guy or something like that. So I'm curious as to, um, yeah, what what kind of what was the genesis of, of this episode in this story? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this is the this is the sweet spot for me. I love sort of a, a fun, high stakes action adventure with really deep emotional undercurrents and a real character study. Because I think that when you put characters in um, high stakes jeopardy, their true colors come out, and it gives you an opportunity to really show through action identify character. Um, and so that was kind of you know, and, and when you know we were talking about two hundred nine, I think you know Martin might have thrown out, let's maybe do something where. Ben and somebody are handcuffed together. When Ben comes to handcuff to somebody, where does that go? And we started brainstorming and thinking that that could be kind of a midnight run adventure. Um, and then we sort of built this um, Kevin character out of that. And then sort of where the episode goes organically from there kind of developed as we were thinking about the story. But I think, you know, for me, like, you know, whether it's uh, the high stakes of we've just been chased with a, you know, bad guys just chased us off the bus and we jumped off the bus and now you know, here we are a little beat up having an emotional conversation about selfishness versus selflessness or whether we are about to be attacked by the bad guys and have to rush to create this sort of like, you know, mousetrap home alone sort of um, yeah. uh, trap for the bad guys. But at the same time, we can, it's putting the pressure on us of who are we at, at our core? Are we, you know, is, is Kevin a fundamentally selfish person or does he actually care about people? Is is Hannah and Ben's relationship going to survive the 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 cauldron of, of, of these stakes. I mean, that's to me the most fun thing to do, which is why I love Quantum Leap because you get to do a, a lot of all of the above. Yeah. Well, I think that one of the things too, that's interesting about Kevin's character is, you know, there's, there's obviously this duplicitous nature, you know, is his criminal side. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I love that it's set up very early in the episode where, you know, he's trying to kind of bribe Ben and, and, and Ben is saying no. And, and, and part of what Kevin says is that he's, you know, he's innocent. He didn't do it. And then immediately he, he mentions the fact that yeah. he's got all these diamonds and all this stuff. And he's like, you didn't, you told me you didn't do it. He's like, I'm a criminal. I lie. Yeah. And I, I love that, you know, even, down to the story about being valedictorian and you know once we meet josh and get a little more information behind that and behind their two upbringings it, it really is wonderful because all of this stuff that i'm talking about is basically in like the first 20 minutes and and we learn so much about kevin and just you know his nature obviously from what we're seeing but then also from what we get from other characters um which i which i love you know, in theater, for instance, one of the one of my favorite things is to always track, you know, when other characters are being spoken about when they're not on stage. Um, and obviously the same is true in film and television. But, you know, I can speak a little bit more to theater with that because you learn so many little details, um, uh, not necessarily about the character specifically, but certainly about other people's perceptions of the character. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, when you're when you're writing things like that to help inform the character, you know, how do you make the choices of 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 doing that? Is it just kind of getting into the mindset of the character you're writing, speaking about them and and their perception? Is it more I want to say this about the character, so I'm going to use this character to, as the vessel? Um, what's yeah, that process like? That's a great question. I mean, I think there's there's two things. So so number one is I always want to put a character on the show that's going to be fun and that uh, is a fun adventure for for the audience to go on. That's the sort of one of the pieces of special sauce of Quantum Leap is that we get to dive deeply into somebody's psyche every week. And it doesn't just have to feel like, okay, we're solving the, the crime mystery of the week, but it's really about the puzzle. Um, yeah. So that was part of it was I, I love the sort of, you know, character who will lie and cheat and steal to get anything they want, but at the same time has something <laughs> underneath like a core hurt. Um, but the, the main thing for me, especially when writing sort of procedural television that's character driven is how can we use that character of the week to drive our character story? Because it's one thing to just do, oh, here's a fun character who comes and then leaves and we don't really think about it. But, you know, what lesson does Ben need to learn this week? Where does Ben's character need to go? Um, and it's always tricky because this is a character who's not tethered to a home base, right? They are not tethered to relationships um, that are sort of physical, but they are tethered to sort of these, um, you know, relationships sort of through time and space. Um, and so, you know, we felt like at this point, after the first eight, Ben needed to maybe think a little bit more about whether he should take care of himself and whether there should be some like selfishness to this journey because he has spent so much time being selfless and that there's not necessarily anything wrong with looking out for yourself while you were also being selfless. And so that was why, you know, Kevin was such a useful uh, agent of change for Ben. So we obviously we have Kevin's journey, but at the same time, at the end of the episode, Ben says to Kevin, maybe you have something here with this whole take care of yourself thing. Um, because it helps him move a little bit more towards, okay, maybe I do need to think about where I'm going with this. If I'm going to be a leaper forever, you know, because he obviously doesn't know about the code that could bring him home. He's starting to get used to the idea that he is a nomad, as we talked about in 208. What does that yeah. mean for him? How is he going to live that life forever? 
Yeah. Oh, that, I mean, I, I love that too, because it is an excellent contrast to some of the stuff that we learn in 208, because there is like, there's this acceptance on Ben's part, obviously that he's a nomad, but then when it looks like, you know, kind of halfway through the episode that he might be stuck there, there's that, there's almost a second of like, okay, you know, this, this might be my life now. Um, and of course that, you know, changes in a flash, but, but now to see him in a situation where, um, yeah, what, how, how, how does he serve himself? Uh, along these journeys serving everyone else and i think that one of the ways that that's illustrated so wonderfully in the episode too is of course the inclusion of hannah and the way that hannah is included um now i you know when i had the pleasure of speaking to um dean and drew uh during secret history uh i just kind of threw out there i was like you know, could we see Hannah get, you know, settle down at some point? Um, I, I because for watching that, I think, just wait, just wait. <laughs> and I think for, for me, from my perspective, one of the reasons why I asked that question is because, um, I, I loved what was happening with the journey and seeing, you, you know, Ben would obviously be gone from her life for a couple of years and then pop back in. But there comes a point when I would hope that she would still be living her life. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and by nomads, it's, you know, it certainly kind of seemed like that, like she was still doing things she was engaging, but she wasn't necessarily seeing anyone that we knew of or anything like that. So when we see her in this episode and now she's married and she, you know, she has a kid, can you talk about some of the discussions and the decisions to, to go forward with that uh, as, as an element of, of not only her story, but with this episode specifically? Yeah, I mean, that was always baked into when we decided to do this story. When we decided that Ben would fall in love over the course of time with somebody, we knew we had an amazing opportunity to tell a love story you don't get to see. I mean, everybody has seen, you know, an epic love triangle. And you've even seen love triangles that take place over many, many years of both of the characters' lives. But we have the unique opportunity to tell a story where one character is living this love story over a couple of days and one character is living this love story over the course of a lifetime. So what can that, you know, do for us? I mean, first of all, there's the the interesting thing, which is tricky to explore with the way we do the show, but whenever Ben shows up, Hannah is looking at a different person, right? Like right. one week she's looking at uh, an ex-military, uh, you know, professor, and then the next week that she's looking at a CIA officer, and this week she's looking at this grizzled bounty hunter, but obviously the soul inside is the same. So what does that say about you know, the physical versus the the spiritual aspects of love, which was always really interesting to us. And then the other aspect, obviously, as you alluded to, is Hannah's going to go on and live her life. I mean, that was always really important to us. This is a remarkable, you know, intelligent, fully realized person. And Ben obviously helps her with her journey between meeting her in 203 and helping guide her in 206 towards, you know, success at Princeton. But at the same time, we did not want her just waiting around for Ben. We wanted her to live a full life. And then test the idea of, can love exist outside the bounds of time and space? And also, can you be in love with two people at the same time? I mean, that scene in Hannah's office where, you know, Ben is saying, you're married, I can't do this. Like maybe, I think in Ben's mind, he's like, okay, maybe this is the end of our relationship. But in Hannah's mind, she's always baked into the way she was going to live her life. That yes, I might get married and yes, I might have a kid, but I will live these days that I have with Ben as sort of my special Ben days, as my special sort of like thing that exists outside of, my monogamous relationship with Josh. And she very much loves Josh. She loves her kid. Ben showing up does not feel like it's going to rip her away from that family, but she feels like she can have this sort of magical moment with him, which she knows is only going to last a little bit of time. And so that was, that was always one of the great um, opportunities we had. And then obviously we have this amazing chemistry between Ray and Eliza that, that really yeah. sells um, that and, and, uh, and, and does a lot of work to sort of um, illustrate the uniqueness of that story. I, it's definitely, I, I mean, I think throughout the season, anytime we see Hannah, uh, I, I, it feels like, uh, you know, business picks up a bit. And I think that the the fascinating thing about in this episode uh, is that, of course, we still have this thing looming over us, you know, that people are coming after Kevin and, and, and by way of Kevin, of course, everyone else. And, uh, and yet, you know, these, these wonderful kind of character moments and progression of Ben and Hannah's story still fit so well within the context of that. How, how do you, like, how do you manage that? Because it feels like in a way you could almost have two separate episodes, right? Mm-hmm. But it, it, it all still fits together really well. So I'm just curious from your perspective, like how do, how do you make that work? Yeah, it's a great question because it, that was the biggest challenge of this one is it, it I, we didn't want it to feel like two episodes mashed into one, you know, we wanted there to feel like there was a unique, singular emotional journey going on for Ben and that there was a reason why he went on this adventure without Hannah for a little while and then Hannah showed up. And so part of that was about, you know, especially if you're watching these episodes directly in a row without having had that time gap, you will have just seen uh, the heartbreak of Ben having to leave her in 208 in Egypt 
and the sort of epic adventure of that. So in his head, it's been moments since that. So he is still reeling from getting pulled away from her. So it's not like he is, you know, resetting and just normal Ben who is going on his normal adventure. He's very much thinking about Hannah in the first half of the episode, which is why he asks his bail bond agent, you know, can you look up Hannah Carson? And he sees, oh, wait, I'm in, I'm, I'm near Princeton, New Jersey. There's gotta be a reason for that. I mean, he's, He's smart enough to figure out that the accelerator is sending him on these adventures. So he's thinking, okay, if I'm in New Jersey, maybe this is another Hannah episode. And then when he can't get a hold of her and he can't get the number and they're being chased and then Kevin brings him to this house, he's thinking, okay, maybe this is not one of those adventures. And then all of a sudden Hannah shows up. So it's, he's already been primed um, very much to be in that space. And then obviously I think a big part of this episode is, you know, what does it mean to have a family? What does it mean to be at home? What does it mean to, to sort of, um, be in, in sort of a, a monogamous relationship versus the sort of like more um, complicated view of love. And so I think that has always been on Ben's mind throughout these last couple of episodes. So to put him in this house with this woman at this time is sort of the perfect opportunity to examine that. Um, and then, yeah, it's a lot of it is just tonal. Like you want to make sure that it doesn't feel like the first half was, you know, a 1980s A-team episode and the second half was <laughs> a melodrama. You want it to feel like the sense of humor and the emotion exists in the first half. We have a lot of nice emotional moments and Addison comes in and we have some of those nice emotional moments. And then we have the same level of emotion, but also humor in the second half of the episode too. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, one of the things that's really nice about once we get to their house is that, yeah, it doesn't lose that sense of humor. And uh, I don't think it, you know, it doesn't lose the momentum either, which is, is so funny because I, I can imagine that there was a danger, especially like, you know, you have characters, one character's getting fixed up, then they're sitting down to dinner and that, but, but it, it doesn't, in my opinion, it doesn't lose the momentum. And a lot of that, you know, from the outside looking in has to do with the fact that, you know, Ben and Hannah are in the same room. She doesn't know that it's him yet. There's, you know, there's still all of this wonderful stuff at play. And I, you know, how conscious were you of, of, of that and making those choices so that things didn't slow down too much, you know, in that kind of like, you know, second half or at least. Yeah. You know, That's yeah, a great a question. I mean, you know, I think, first of all, when we got to the house, even if Hannah hadn't been a part of the episode, there's always the danger that, oh, my gosh, we've been running and jumping and, and falling out of buses and car chases <laughs> the whole episode. And now all of a sudden we're in domestic drama. So we very much were conscious of not wanting it to feel like it was slowing down. So, this, you know, we have this nice scene between Josh and Ben while Ben's getting fixed up. And it's sort yeah. of, OK, I'm getting a little bit more of a window into who Kevin is, as you suggested. You know, you get a lot of um, insight into people when you have two characters talking about a third and then Hannah shows up. So we immediately are back with, uh, you know, sort of leaning into, okay, where is this going? And then, you know, to me, I, I could have written that dinner scene to be 10 minutes. Like, I love the idea of <laughs> Ben being sort of torn between, I love this woman, and yes, she's holding hands with this man that she loves, and do I say anything? But obviously, we want to keep the pace up. And so we have the, you know, the, the reveal come pretty quickly. Um, yeah. And I hope the audience is still, you know, sort of invested in, okay, where has Hannah been for the last nine years? How does Ben feel about the fact that she's married? And then all of a sudden, you know, the stakes quickly ramp back up when we realize that that uh, the bad guys are coming. So, you know, that's to me the the hard part and the fun part of writing these kinds of shows is amping the stakes up when you need to amp them up and amping the tension and the and the speed of the episode up and then and then stopping down and doing a little bit of character without feeling like it's it's slow. Yeah. You know, so you mentioned the nine years and I want to point that out for a moment because I, I know that there was definitely some rumblings, uh, you know, within the fan community about the fact that the previous three Hannah leaps, there was, there was always six years in between them. Mm. And so now to go from like having, you know, that gap to all of a sudden now it's nine years. Um, was there any, uh, there's multiple questions here, but I'll just ask this one first. Was there any um, like conscious thought given to the amount of time spent between leaps, like in those first three uh, uh, Hannah leaps? And, and and then it's extended and longer in this, or was it? Was that just kind of like it happened that way? It wasn't we wanted time to we wanted enough time to pass where Hannah had had lived a chunk of her life. I mean, I think if Ben leaped into 1946 and then leapt into 1947, you don't get to see what is the point of this episode, this, sure. this story, which is a woman going through an entire life's arc while Ben is day to day seeing her. So the idea that you know she was in a small town in, in you know um, in New Mexico, and then all of a sudden you know, is uh, a graduate assistant at Princeton and then, you know, this really successful researcher and, and, and uh, um, academic and then now the chair of the department at Princeton. Like, you, you have to have these big time jumps. And also, to, your, to the point we were talking about earlier, we want Hannah to, to have an emotional transformation each, each time that we see her. So, like, you need some time to pass for us to go from this wild, 
you know, sort of Casablanca adventure in, in Egypt to <laughs> I'm a domestic, um, you know, I'm in a domestic world with a, with a husband and a kid and I have a fully realized professional life as the chair of the department of Princeton. Um, you need a lot of time to pass for that to be the case. Yeah. But it wasn't, a, you know, but it has to be six years each time. I think a lot of it actually was driven by, you know, what year did we want the leap to be? And then I think to the extent that it was six years a couple of times was just, a, a, you know, a happy coincidence. But like we needed 203 to be when it was because of the nature of Project Blue Book. And then we needed 206 to be when it was because of the nature of when Einstein shows up and dies at Princeton and, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, one of the things that I love is is, is that, yeah, is, is being able to see this passage of time and see the, the growth of the character. And it's one of the things, having the good fortune of spoken to Eliza twice now, one of the things that we talked about both times was, you know, what is Hannah's journey like outside of the leaps? And obviously there wasn't, you know, much she could say at, at risk of spoilers or any of that sort of thing. But I love the fact that the character is, yes, definitely getting the chance to live her life. And I think that it adds to uh, the richness of the character and the agency of the character as well. She's not just sitting around waiting for Ben to come back. Um, um, which is which is great. Um, you you spoke briefly about the nature of love and you, you know Hannah's perspective on that and the conversation that she has with Ben. Um, do you think that there? Like, first of all, I think it's lovely personally. I I thought when Dean mentioned on the show, um, you know that that love being infinite and 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 uh, you know just his perspective, I, I loved that. Uh, and then seeing it brought in, you know, so explicitly in this way as Hannah explains her ability to love Ben and still love Josh and have this family with Josh. Um, I would, I, I, I would love to hear a, a little bit more uh, uh, perspective about that and some deeper thoughts perhaps about, uh, you know, Hannah's thoughts on love, what that means for her relationship with Ben going forward. And also how you think maybe the, you know, the, the public or the casual viewer even of the show might react to that because it isn't something, you know, mm -hmm. that's necessarily generally accepted, you, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like polyamory in general is something that, that has a hard time finding general acceptance, for instance, not that this is necessarily what that is specifically, but it's certainly related, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. There are two really good questions. And let me start with the first one, which is the sort of derivation of the, the conversations about love. I mean, I've, I've talked a little bit about it. I know Dean's talked a little bit about it. But the, the other you know piece that I can add to it is, you know, Hannah has this line, every parent knows when you have a child, your heart expands. I mean, that came out of a conversation that was, it was actually in a later draft of the script that, that Dean and I had this conversation. We were, you know, Dean and I, um, our kids are actually friends. We, we knew each other from before the show because our, our sons are friends and we both oh. talk a lot about parenting and the challenges of parenting, you know, outside of work um, and the challenges of having multiple kids who have different, you know, agendas and, and, and needs. And, and we have talked a lot about this idea that, you know, it feels like there should be a finite amount of love as a parent, but you do find the capacity to, expand your heart as your family expands. Um, and so we were sort of talking about Hannah and realizing that, oh, she, as somebody with a kid, she might have a different perspective on love um, because of that. And so that kind of informed that a lot. And I think we wanted her um, status as both a brilliant academic and this sort of like um, amazing adventurer and also a mother to inform all of that. Um, and yeah, it is, a, it is a challenge, especially to a broadcast network audience to accept the idea that you can be in love with two people <laughs> at the same time. And, I, you know, I'm not actually sure, you know, where my head and heart lie on that question, but I do think it is a, you know, wildly valid area to explore, um, yeah. you know, is, is can you be in love with two people at the same time? And it's also, it's not, you know, we, we talked about sort of actually explicitly calling out the idea of monogamy being an outdated concept. And I think at one point we had... Um, Hannah saying something like, you know, for a man from the future, you sure do have an outdated view of love. But, um, <laughs> but, but it, we didn't want it to be caught, tied up in sort of like things that people are going to have a larger uh, point of view on coming into the show. Sure. To us, there's something so specific about this idea that she's going to spend just a couple of days with this person over the course of a lifetime. It's not a direct yeah. situation where she's in love with two people and having two families or, or, or a polyamorous relationship in her house. It's something more specific to quantum leap that could only exist on quantum leap, which is, you know, I fully love my husband. He's my partner. He's my rock. And yet Ben is her soulmate in a very different way. And I think that's a really yeah. 
um, rich area to explore and, um, you know, goes to some interesting places from here, which I can't get into, but I'm sure you'll right. keep watching. Well, that, that brings me to a question, which I'm sure there won't, you won't be able to directly answer. That's fine. But one question that I did have, you know, when, when watching the episode and the, uh, upon my first viewing, it, it was an answer that I felt like I was sure I knew the answer to, but Upon my rewatch, I started to kind of wonder, well, there's nothing that says that that couldn't be the case. And I'm just curious if this is something that Hannah has already talked to Josh about. Like, mm. you know, has Hannah has Hannah discussed, you know, this time traveler you know, with the nature of their relationship and their romance and stuff. So it's certainly a question I have uh, about that. <laughs> it is a question I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, politely pass on, on sure. the answer. But you, will, you will get an answer to that. Um, I'll, I'll answer a totally different question that you didn't ask, but for sure, um, you know, I wanted to mention, which is, you know, the idea of being in love with two people at the same time. And, and it was very tricky for us to work this into the episode because of the nature of the way, um, uh, it plays, but, you know, Ben also has two people in his life that he is in love with. Yes. And Addison has two people in her life that she is in love with. And so for Addison to be able to witness these conversations, for Ben to be able to think about the idea of, you know, can you be in love with two people at the same time? we really felt like was an important piece of the puzzle to add in because Ben and Addison's adventure is obviously not finished. Um, right. And we can't really talk necessarily about where it's going, but at the same time, we want the audience to be sort of torn about um, how they feel about, uh, about that. And we want the audience to feel torn about how Addison feels about, you know, the fact that she is in love with Tom and yet still potentially can't get over Ben. Um, and so I think, you know, those conversations also are playing in subtext and looks and performance. But I think at the same time, uh, it was really exciting for us to be able to kind of explore that um, in this context. And I'm, I hope I successfully dodged your question about Josh without giving any. Questions. Yes, totally, totally did. Uh, and, and, and I'm glad that you did bring that up because it was something that was on my mind as well. Um, the nature of, you know, Ben's feelings towards Addison, Addison's feelings towards Ben, of course, and Tom as well. And, and, and it, it does feel there are these very genuine connections that all of these people share, you know, and, 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 and love. Uh, it doesn't feel like it should be something that, you know, you can only feel once, right. You know, the way that yeah, says it. and it's, it's just that, that, that one thing. And certainly their circumstances, I think uh, in this, in this wonderful sort of sci-fi world that we have allow us to explore some of these questions in a way that feels, I don't want to say less threatening because that might sound but but in a way, I mean that that's the way I can articulate it best. It might feel a little bit less threatening than if you're coming on this issue like head on, right? And 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 certainly the way that we have seen love explored and and you know people who are with someone and then fall in love with someone else in you know on network television to be sure in the past is basically that you know hearts are getting broken and you know whatnot. So um, I I do really in, enjoy the dialogue that's being created around it within the show itself with with this episode specifically and. And obviously for our characters, it, it, the emotional stakes are, are pretty high. Um, yeah, it's also, I, feel like it's probably, I think there is something, ahead, yeah. you know, you're, you're mentioning that it's coming from this sort of like five feet above the ground sort of science fiction world. But I think it's also a super relatable idea, not just in the sense that people have been in relationships and then, you know, fallen out of love and fallen in love with somebody else. But like, it's deliberate that we made Tom a widow, right? Tom is somebody who mm -hmm. loved his wife. She died he still loves her and right. yet he's in love with another person. It does not deny his love for his wife. It's not a finite yes. thing where you only have one love chip that you can give. And, and, and so, you know, we wanted to put, whether it's Hannah with her child, Tom with his, um, his late wife, you know, Ben and Addison, Addison and Tom, Hannah and Josh and Ben, like, you know, there's a lot of different uh, variations on a theme in this episode that I feel like are, are pretty universally relatable to an audience. I would hope. I agree with you. And I, and I will even go one step further and add magic and Beth into the mix as well, because I think mm -hmm. for a lot of fans, especially fans of the classic series, seeing Beth move on. I know there were some people that had a bit, 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 bit of difficulty with that. Totally yeah. understandable, but it goes to your point as well that, you know, it does not change Beth's love for Al or their love story or the way that that love story was told in the classic series whatsoever. And, you know, and it does not negate her feelings for magic either. It, it, it's the idea that yes, the, the capacity is there to to love more than once because how awful and terrible and sad would it be if you can only love one person and then yes they do die you, you know or right. something separates you or whatever and now you're never allowed to love anybody again i mean that's that's just awful and and, and i right. would not want to to live in that world um 
I want to go back to Josh real quick uh, because I had heard uh, the Quantum Leap podcast had the opportunity to interview Josh Dean, and apparently he had said that uh, uh, the he, the role was written for with him in mind. Is that true? Yeah. So Josh, <laughs> so um, I wrote on Blindspot with Martin for five years, which is how I yeah. um, came into this universe. And Josh was a recurring on Blindspot, um, playing a character called Boston Arliss Crab, which was very different than this character. <laughs> but, um, it's no accident that the the character in the, the story is named Josh, and we cast Josh. It's because we um, we had him in mind. In fact, Joe Menendez, our director, um, who I know also spoke, I believe, with the QLP, um, had yes, worked with right. him on Kung Fu. And when he read the script, he had Josh in mind to play Kevin, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, and I, thought, I think he could have done a great job. But I think, um, you know, Josh Dean, the actor, who is a, a wonderful person and, and, and sort of like, you know, one of the biggest hearted, generous, funny, friendly people to, to have on a, on a set or in your life, um, brings this emotional depth to him when he shows up. I mean, like, I, I get chills every time I watch the cut or when I was on the set when he just shows up at the door and sees his brother and his face says so much. And that was really important to us because not only do you need to understand that Kevin doesn't like his brother and that his brother, you know, and vice versa, but it was really important to us that the person that Hannah married be a remarkable person that Hannah Absolutely. didn't settle, that Hannah is not, you know, in a slummy relationship and therefore just waiting around for Ben that she married somebody pretty remarkable. You know, the, you know, he's a, a, a medical doctor. He's, you know, an, an extraordinary father. He is, you know, a really kind and empathetic person. He just has this damaged relationship with his brother. And that's a lot to, 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 um, to show in a very brief amount of screen time. And so I, we were blessed yeah. to be able to have Josh Dean play the role because he can, he can play all of that in, 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 in a very brief amount of time. Yeah, well, one of the things, uh, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, that I was really struck by uh, in my second watch uh, was the conversation that, that he has with Ben while he's kind of you know patching Ben up after they they first arrived at the house, uh, because it really does shine through, especially the nature of his relationship with his brother, as frustrated and annoyed as he clearly is with his brother, there is still, it is undeniable that there is still this affection that there is still this connection between the two of them and uh again upon my se second watch when i was really picking up on more of that it 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 really it moved me to be more invested with both of them quite frankly uh you know even though kevin's not in the scene at all um so I think, yeah, I, I think ultimately it, it pays off and, and, and he does a wonderful job. And of course, you know, I want to know if we'll see him again. And I have a feeling we will, but I don't imagine you can answer that question. So, <laughs> um, well, one of the things that I will uh, mention, I'll just kind of jump to the end right now. I, I want to talk to you about more things, but since we are talking about Josh, of course, the, the reveal that comes at the very end of the episode um, as Addison is doing the wrap up for Ben and, and letting him know how everything's going to go. Uh, she mentions that Josh will, will die suddenly of an aortic em uh, embolism um, in, in, in a few years time. And Ben of course turns around to, to try to uh, warn Hannah about this because, you know, there's a surgery that it, it can be fixed. And then he leaps. Um, it, I, 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 I think it's a very affecting moment and, 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 and it will, I think people will, uh, I'm really interested to see how people are going to react to it. Quite frankly, you talk about the, the decision-making process that went, you know, not only to deciding to reveal it at that moment, which is perfect, obviously, but, uh, but the decision to actually have that be the case. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, one of the things that's really sort of rich about this show is he's a time traveler who is given a specific mission by the accelerator but yet, if you're showing up in a time and space, if you're in 1943, like, why not just take a quick flight over to Germany and and, and kill Hitler, you know? Or if you're right. showing up in, um, you know, uh, 1982, why not take a detour over to your mom and, and give her a stock tip or two, you know, <laughs> on, the, on the other side of the, on the ledger. But Ben and the Quantum Leap Project are so committed to this idea that we are sent to a time and place to help who we're supposed to help. And we're not supposed to go off script. And so we actually wanted to have a longer conversation between Addison and Ben about, do I warn Hannah? Because that wasn't really why I was sent here. I was sent here to protect Kevin, to make sure that he was able to not get killed by these bad guys and then move on and, and repair this relationship with his brother. I wasn't here to stop Josh Nyan. What are the butterfly effects that could happen if I 
you know, go tell him. And then it changes history in a way that I wasn't supposed to change. You know, the, the, the accelerator sends us to a time and place and gives us a mission for a reason, which is that we don't want to alter history too much. Right. We would have loved to have had that conversation, but it was sort of awkward to have all of that play and then have it leap. It was, it felt like a little bit too convenient. Sure. Um, but I mean, uh, you know, I think Ben is, wasn't entertaining that question. He was just, he loves Hannah and he does not want to see her in pain. And, and the other piece of that that's interesting is he loves Hannah and yet he wants to go warn her to save the life of the person that's standing in between him and Hannah. Right. And that's the, the person that Ben is. He just cares so much about, um, you know, people that he wants to do the right thing regardless of how it would affect him. So all of that was was playing underneath the sort of 15 second conversation that happens between Ben and Addison. <laughs> Um, but you know, uh, it's very much deliberate that we put that there and, you know, who, who knows where that story is going. I, I, yeah. I'm not a liberty to say, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, we wanted it to be kind of a tricky choice for Ben. And then now obviously he's traveling through time and space again, like where will he end up? When will he end up? Will he end up crossing paths with them again? All open questions that we want, uh, the audience to be wondering about. Yeah, well, I, I think that um, I think I can say this because it was it was actually out there. So I'm not spoiling anything. But I do know that the next episode takes place in 1953, uh, which which I think is is fascinating to me, because uh, I feel like that's a it, it's a it takes Ben to a time where he can't warn Hannah, in my opinion. Um, and, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Uh, but anyway, all I can say is I'm very excited about that exact question. Um, yeah, <laughs> excellent. Uh, what we came up with was one of my favorite things that we've done this season. Um, and it's certainly not, uh, it's going to, the, the question is, is out there. Let me just put it that yeah. way. It's not, it's, okay. not, uh, it's not a closing thing for that episode. So um, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions just about like kind of your involvement with the show in general. I, I want to talk a little bit more uh, about off the cuff, but before we do that, um, you know, when, when we spoke, last season you had come into the show uh after things had already started up um and uh you know we're, we're there obviously for the, the the back end of season one being now here for the full season the beginning of season two and being here as long as you have um how do you think the show has changed and grown since you came aboard yeah i mean i'm I, without my involvement at all being a factor, I think we have just as a group kind of figured out how to do this show as, as is the case with any show, you know, if you watch any show, um, they kind of figure it out deeper in. Now I, you know, <laughs> it's sort of like I, I came in after a lot of the heavy lifting had been done because most of the time it's those first sort of 10 to 12 episodes where you're trying to figure out exactly what is the show? <laughs> what can we do on the show? And you're sort of, you don't have the time to really think, you know, 10 episodes ahead because you're so desperate to kind of keep the trains on time. And every show I've been on that was season one was like that. I just happened to come in after a lot of that stuff had been <laughs> settled out. And so by the time I came on, which was sort of halfway through season one, we had a pretty good plan for, you know, where we wanted to go in terms of the, the Leaper X story and where we wanted it to take Ben and Addison and the, and the, you know, 118 into 201 of it all was all kind of figured out as we were getting there. So, so we had a lot more solid footing as we came into season two. Um, the deficit we had was we had no time. We didn't have the typical amount of time you have between seasons. As I think you alluded to, we went right. right from writing season one to season two. So we didn't have a ton of time, but we did make sure to take, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe it was just two to sort of ask ourselves, okay, where did we end season one emotionally? Where do we want to go season two emotionally? What do we want the end of the season to be? You know, we didn't even know our episode number order. We thought it could be either eight or 13 or, or 18. So we sort of had to be modular about that. Um, and then really sort of think about what aspects of season one do we want to keep using? What aspects of season one maybe weren't working as well? Um, you know, who, who do we want to bring in as new characters? Because we obviously wanted to bring in some new blood. We had the time jump pretty early on. That was a part of the, the story that, that Martin and Dean knew they wanted to do pretty early. Um, and so that gives you a lot of opportunities to think about okay, what's happened to these people over the course of these years. Um, yeah. And so that was, you know, it was, I think watching the show evolve, it's really just, you know, and it was a largely similar team between seasons one and two. And so we kind of had uh, a, a rhythm and a, and a, a collective language and, and sort of knew what worked and what didn't. And then the other fun thing about season two is maybe you tried something in season one and it didn't work, but let's try it again in season two. And, and you know, I mean, something that ended up on the cutting room floor, like a, a leap that we thought about that we couldn't make work or a, or a character one we thought we couldn't make work. And now, now that we know how to do the show a little better, now that we, we sort of have a little bit more foresight about where we're going, we can use some of those pieces that we were all really excited about we didn't get to do. Um, 
And I think, um, I, I hope the audience is, I mean, I, I've, I've appreciated all the kind words about this season. I, I hope, um, hope the audience is feeling that sort of like rhythm we're getting into in a way. Yeah, I mean, again, I can only really offer my perspective, but I certainly think so. And I, I, I felt, you know, just even more engaged with the with the season as, as a whole and the characters. Um, you know, the time jump uh, ha has just worked out so beautifully. And and when I, I, I heard about it very early uh, as a result of some shenanigans, but uh, uh, I am just I think it's remarkable the way that it's that it's been pulled off and and the depth that it's added especially to the characters what were your initial reactions when you heard that that was the direction that you were going I, I loved it because I think it's so hard to um tell a new story you know these are I always think of seasons as chapters as as um you know books in a series right totally. you know the, the episodes are chapters and the books and the, and the seasons are, are, are books but it's all one series and so you know, the, the, the challenge that any novelist might face when they start to write book two is how do you tell a different story while at the same time feeling continuity from book one? And the same is true with, you know, seasons of television. Seasons two in particular, I could, you know, a whole different podcast could be had on the phenomenon of season twos, which I think are generally weaker than the first seasons if you like look at the course of the history of television. And so that's the challenge you face is, you know, how do we do something different, but still it's the same show and yet stir the pot in a way. And so... You know, I believe it was Martin who had the idea of this three-year time jump. And immediately all of us, and Dean's talked on your podcast about how immediately all of us thought, oh, that's there's so many possibilities. What were all these folks up to? Did anybody give up on Ben? And what did that look like? And, you know, obviously, I think it's been alluded to that we had more scenes that we wanted to show that happened in the time gap, and we just didn't have the time to do yeah. them about, you know, when did Addison finally decide she was going to move on? And, and the, the, I think she, in, the dialogue alludes to she hit rock bottom and tried to jump into the accelerator to save him and you know, almost the suicide mission. We were going to show some of that. We just didn't have a chance to do it. But, you know, there's just so much you can do to sort of reorient the, ch the chess pieces on the board, but use the same pieces um, to, to tell this, you know, a, an equally compelling story. Yeah, I, you know, you, you bring up Addison and, and the time that she may have waited and, and that sort of thing. And, and that'll bring us right back to off the cuff because one of the scenes that I love, I mean, I always love these scenes. I just think it's a wonderful opportunity to kind of like, just I, you get to take a breath within the leap story while then engaging, you know, on this really wonderful personal character level with, you know, with the characters and, and specifically the scenes that we've seen this season between Addison and Magic have just been these really lovely moments for her to kind of like check in and, and let mm -hmm. us know where she's at and for Magic to offer some sage advice. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I've, and I've really enjoyed those scenes a lot this season, quite frankly, and this one's no exception because... Um, you know, it puts us in Addison's head in this lovely way where she gets to just say what I think a lot of us have been thinking and feeling as viewers, you know, as the season has progressed. And 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 I would love to just hear a little bit about that scene and, and about the decision to have Addison just articulate it so directly mm -hmm. that this is what this feels like. Yeah, that, that's a, that was a really, um, that scene was really emblematic of what's great about this show. So, so you know, when... We made the decision that that Addison was going to find the ring in 208 and then she was going to think Tom was about to propose, but he has this DARPA file. Obviously, Addison's head is spinning. And you would love to have the scene with Dr. Melfi where she gets to talk about where her head is <laughs> at 209, but that's just not the show we're in. We're not in a show that stops and talks, you know, at length about each emotional moment because the trains are always moving so fast. Yeah. And there's this scene early on in the episode where they're talking about, do we tell Ben? Can we bring him home? Ian is talking about whether they think this is a, you know, valid lead or just a, you know, a flash in the pan. And I wanted to be able to have Addison articulate, you know, how much of a hurricane her head is, but it just doesn't, she can't say those things out loud, but we have the fortune of having Caitlin as an actress who can pull that off with the way that she's standing and the way that she's orienting herself towards the scene, even just the blocking of putting her on the end of the, on the end of the row and, and you know, the yeah. missing when somebody asks her a question and having that they ask twice. I, mean, I, I think you're getting a lot of that, but yet you want her to be able to articulate it. And, you know, Ian actually has this funny exchange where they say to, to Jen, you know, how would you feel if you're, you know, you thought you're about to be proposed to you by your boyfriend, but instead your other ex-fiance might, you know, be able to come home and, and, you know, it's sort of articulating the absurdity of the moment, but then you right. want, you want to hear it from Addison. You want to hear where her head is and you don't want to just hear her say, I love Ben and I love Tom and I don't know what to do. I think you want to see the tumult that she feels about, um, about uh, this sort of predicament that the, that the universe has put her in. And then I had lots, lots of conversations with Caitlin in prep because she wanted to make sure that 
the character felt the right level of frustration at the universe for putting her in this position. Mm-hmm. And we talked about that performance and that was actually not originally how I thought the scene was going to be played, but I thought it was so much better the way that she played it. Just, you know, the sort of um, anger at the situation yeah. and yet the yearning that she feels to have something feel settled and walk on solid ground. Um, I thought her performance in that scene was really remarkable. I agree. And one of the things uh, about you were just saying that I love too, is it really takes us away from any kind of melodrama because it's not about Tom and it's not about Ben. It's about Addison. It's about, mm-hmm. this is how I feel. Damn it. Like I'm mad because like you said, this is the, what, why is the universe messing with me? And, well, and, and is, I, it works. Yeah. And this is, and we'll get into this in a little bit as a show, but like she was supposed to be the leaper. So like, so for, for, you know, yeah. 21 episodes, a lot of her decisions have been shortcutted by somebody jumping in front of her in line and making a decision for her, whether it was Ben or now this DARPA file, like she, okay, fine. I know where I am. I'm going to marry Tom, you know, and then the universe throws this other curveball at her. So she, she has very much just wanted to feel like she could be settled in the place that she is. And there's just curveball after curveball after curveball thrown at her. And, you know, this character really just wants to wrestle some agency back and, um, Again, I can't really articulate exactly where we're going, but I will say that sure. that is something that is going to very much come into play over the last four episodes is just her making some decisions for herself. That's excellent. That's excellent. And I, I, I want to go back real quick to just to just to articulate this because I agree with you that moment when she is kind of zoned out when they're kind of all meeting around uh, Ian's terminal and they're you know looking at the DARPA stuff. There's something about the way that like the look on Caitlin's face that it really is like one of my favorite times I've ever seen a character like zoned out. You know what I mean? Like it's just because it, it just felt so genuine, so real, so honest. It was very it was wonderfully played. And it's one of those moments that I love because it's, you know, she's not venting to magic she's not having mm-hmm. this moment instead it's just it's something really subtle and i thought that it was wonderful i also yeah, love jed's you know, response a lot of shows. Oh, sorry, go ahead. oh no go ahead I, I, I want to hear that go ahead i was gonna say i've done a lot of shows where there's sort of an action adventure taking place out in the world and then you have your characters on your standing set you know typing to try to figure out the plot and those scenes can be you know a little uh tough because there's only so many different ways you can play we're all looking at the computer and, and ian makes a snarky comment and then right. we we have a conclusion and we all clap at the end and say go then obviously we have to do those scenes on the show but I, I always want them to be about something else you know i want them to be some other character dynamic that's happening in the scene so it's not just an information dump you know the plot that is happening in that scene is we are going over whether or not this is a valuable lead and whether we're going to tell ben but emotionally that scene is so much about you know, we've had so many false starts. Are we going to be able to finally get over the hump on this? And then Addison obviously playing what we just talked about. So it was, that's the, the luxury you have when you have such a talented cast is, you know, Caitlin's playing an entirely different scene than what the dialogue is, but it still plays yeah. because we're able to sort of see that on her and the way the scene is directed. Joe did an incredible job sort of making sure that that was coming through as we we're also getting a lot of the information. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, and, and, and I think that one of the things that I love about a lot of these scenes, quite frankly, is, is that there are other shows out there that are fine and wonderful and people like them. But when they have a scene similar to this, I almost feel like the dialogue is interchangeable from episode to episode. Like, it doesn't really matter. And and I feel like, you know, this scene, you know, obviously, it couldn't exist in another episode. And, and, and it benefits so much from what has come before. And it benefits so much of being able to look at, you know, what might be next, obviously, with the DARPA projects and stuff. We do get left hanging though with Jen's line. I want to know what Jen was going to say. I want to know what 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 parallel is she drawing between her own personal life? Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> that's potentially to come at some day. I mean, that's the, that's the the hardest part about writing this show for me, or one of the hardest parts is that we have to because of the nature of the show, we're so much with Ben and the Leap, and these we have these phenomenal actors and characters who are going through their own journeys, and there just isn't really the time to delve yeah. as much as we want into that. I think, you know, Marissa actually added a little bit to that line. I think both in terms of the dialogue and the way she was performing it, that wasn't in the original script that was so lived in, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the, like that's the nice thing about working with, with talented folks is that they can add so much in so little, you know? Well, any, any opportunity for more, for more Jen, uh, I'm, I'm always excited for. Um, so I, I'm curious too. uh, again, kind of stepping back just a moment from, from off the cuff specifically, um, 
to some of your duties in general around in the show when you're not specifically writing an episode. Um, I, I had heard that you were doing some producing duties on the, on the finale, for instance. I, I've heard, obviously, that you're a big presence in the writer's room, etc. Um, everyone says you're wonderful that I've spoken with. I've heard you described as a true mensch. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, like, what, what, you know, what are some of the other things that you're doing on the, on the larger level with day-to-day stuff when you're not necessarily writing a specific yeah. episode? Um, well, I was, you know, so when I was brought into the show, one of the, pro- one of the problems that they were having before was you know because everybody was so busy there wasn't always the same people in the writer's room so what ended what ended up happening is you know they'd be working on a story and then someone would leave set and someone would go to set and all of a sudden you'd have a a whole new set of voices and who hadn't been in the room for the first part of the conversation and so this is actually what i did on on blind spot as well is i was sort of sort of intended to be the person who was always in the room who always had the vision of the show in terms of story and where the characters were going in mind and I wasn't going to go on set a lot in season one. Um, and so Drew, uh, speaking of Mensch, the Mensch that he was, ended up producing my <laughs> season one episode because we were deep into starting season two as we were on set for that. And if I had gone on set to produce the, that episode, I would have, you know, we would have had the exact same problem we had season one, which is, you know, the lack of sure. sort of one, you know, clarity of, of, of where the show was going. We had the luxury this time of when when 209 was being produced, we were done with the writer's room. And I love being on set, especially on this show, which was an absolute joy. I mean, we have a a wonderfully talented crew. Uh, I had an amazing director. And then obviously this cast is is so delightful. And the guest cast was was wonderful, too. So it was really fun to be able to be on set and not have to feel like I was missing what was going on in the writer's room, um, which is sort of a place that I truly love and I truly feel at home. (laughs) Um, and then, you know, we're all as producers doing sort of a little bit of everything. We're all weighing in on casting. We're all weighing in on cuts. Um, you know, Martin and Dean are obviously sort of the final, um, vision of all of those things and really are, you know, sort of the the dual quarterbacks of the team. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a collective television. The wonderful thing about television is it's a collective process. So anytime a script comes out, an outline, a cut, we all get to read them and look at them and sort of weigh in. Yeah, uh, that's that's very very cool. I, I I love the collaborative process, you know, in general. But but hearing about the the nature of this show and the way that it's produced and, and what everyone says, uh, it it does feel like it stands out in a lot of ways. I mean, most of this, the people that I've spoken to have talked about how it does feel like a special environment compared to other things that they might have worked on before. Um, do you get that feeling too? That that it that it it really is kind of maybe a, a set apart from some of the other stuff. Yeah, it's a really. Um... I think overall, you know, it's a very kind group, you know, it's a very generous group. I mean, obviously the talent is extraordinary as, you know, yeah. our, our cast, our writers, our crew, our, our, you know, everybody from, you know, top of the departments on down are very talented, but they're just, there's a warmth and a kindness and a sort of generosity to it. You know, I've been on sets that aren't um, as, as much like that. Um, but, and I, you know, to some degree that I, I always, I, I like to credit Ray with that, which is that when you're number one on the call sheet, is um, sort of a mensch and a, and a, and a big hearted person, it, it trickles down and, you know, vice versa is also true when that's not the case. Um, but, you know, and then also Martin and Dean who are just like, yeah. you know, the most extraordinarily generous people, both creatively and personally and professionally, you know, I've worked with Martin for a long time. I've known Dean for a long time and just to watch them lead this group of folks, it really does work its way down from there. Um, you know, uh, there's the expression of fish stinks from the head. I'm not exactly sure what the opposite of that is, but that's, that's what's going on. In our show. <laughs> the, the fish is, uh, is, is, you know, smells glorious from the head. So I think, um, you know, we have, a we just have a really, um, special group and I, I, I hope we get to keep going with it because, uh, you know, it would be a shame to, to only get two years of this. I think I'm very hopeful that we'll get more. So I'm not, I'm not super worried about it, but, um, yeah, but, uh, yeah. That's that's awesome. I, I I love to hear that. Obviously, um, I you know I I just I have to ask because I'm very curious. I know you can't say anything specific, but uh, I, and I don't know anything specific, which I'm grateful for, quite honestly. But uh, what was it like being on set for the finale? It was a and blast. How often so, were you there? So that came about because you know um, Drew uh, had baby, and so wasn't yep. sure if he was going to be able to. wrote an unbelievable finale script. I mean, it's truly fantastic, and that he wasn't sure if he was going to be able to be on set, but he was. So I sort of volunteered and Dean volunteered to kind of cover the days that that, that, Dean, that Drew couldn't be there. And then it turned out that Drew was able to be there for a lot of it. Dean was able to be there for a lot of it. So there's sort of a lot of times there were three of us or we, or more on set sort of weighing in. And, you know, I, it was Drew's baby. And so I I sort of, you know, mostly was just there to sort of cheer on um, and catch, <laughs> you know, maybe catch a note here or there. 
Um, but it was, it was like, I've been on set lots and lots and lots of times where I am the sort of main producer on set. You feel stressed about like, does this wardrobe tell the story that we want to tell? And, uh, is this performance going to be exactly right? And it was nice to kind of let, you know, uh, uh, Drew sort of run with that and just kind of be able to weigh in as I weighed in and watch the, the show be made. And then, you know, it was, it was directed by our producing director, Chris Grismer, who is in addition to being yeah. a phenomenal director has been with the show since the beginning. So, you know, that when he's making a choice, he knows, okay, when we do this, this is what it's supposed to look like. And when a character is going to this room, this is the direction they go. Or when tonally, when, you know, when Ben is leaping, here's what that looks like. Or, you know, like all of those different types of choices, you feel in very good hands when you have, um, when you have Chris directing. Nice. Nice. Um, well, uh, I, I obviously I don't want to give off the cuff any short shrift and I'm just curious, you know, you, you mentioned kind of uh, midnight run earlier. Uh, were, were there other, any other influences you had? And in an episode where I feel like there's so much sparkling dialogue, especially between Kevin and Ben, um, uh, is there ever the temptation or how do you resist the temptation to basically just parrot or ape something that might be an inspiration or something that's come before that sits in a similar genre? Yeah. I mean, look, I, I love any of those sort of buddy cop road movies, whether it's the night run planes, trains and automobiles is a favorite of mine. <laughs> um, you know, any sort of mismatch duo on the road with adventure is always going to bring me joy. And then I'll get back to your question about tone in a second, but um, yeah, but home alone, oddly was an influence because we knew that we wanted them in the house. We knew we wanted the bad guys to come to the house and we knew we wanted them to set a trap. And so obviously very different movie tonally, but sort of the, the fun of that was always there for us in terms of aping, you know, you start with, you know, okay, this is maybe the couple of movies in the genre that we want to look at. And how can we do that differently? The great thing is like, let's just take midnight run as an example. Midnight run is, you know, De Niro, who is, uh, you know, the grumpiest grump grizzled cop, you could come up with. And then Groden, who is neurotic and annoying and, you know, actually has kind of a big heart. Um, and by nature, Ben can't do that. Ben cannot be the grizzled, annoyed person. That's just not who right. he is. So how do you take the world's most annoying criminal and make him different than Charles Groden in Midnight Run, which I think we did, but with the same mission, which is I've got to escape. Every time I'm handcuffed to this guy, I'm thinking, how do I get unhandcuffed? <laughs> and how do you put Ben's unique sort of superpower, which is his empathy front and center mm. when he's sitting next to the most annoying guy in the world. And what was great for us is that, you know, there's the scene outside the gas station where Addison says, this guy's a scumbag. And Ben says, this can't be the mission. Like I'm, I'm always sent to help a good person achieve something in their life. And that's what Ben is doing the entire first half of the episodes. He's trying to figure out what is the good in this person that I'm supposed to bring out. It's very hard to find, especially when yeah. I see him shoplifting teddy bears at a, gas, <laughs> at, a, at a bus station, but I am, you know, the world's most empathetic uh, person. I'm going to find the sort of um, soft core inside of the hard shell. And yes, you know, he finds that he has this fractured relationship with his brother. He finds that he cares about his sister-in-law and his nephew. Um, and he gets him to do the selfless thing in the end. So I think that is going to be so different than what we've seen in the sort of cliche of, you know, uh, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Plain Search Automobiles or Midnight Run or any of these movies, like you're already inverting it on its head there. So, um, and then, you know, it's just like you have act two actors who, who are always going to bring something different to the table. We also, David uh, Rogers, who played Kevin, yeah. was also on Long Spot as well. And he, he brought such a fun energy to that character, but a, a real emotional depth to it, which um, already is going to make it feel unique. Yeah, he was he was wonderful, and I mean, just handled that dialogue superbly, and 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 I I really enjoyed uh, him. And one of the things that I enjoyed in general is I felt like it was just such a strong guest cast. And I mean, obviously, like David and and uh, and, and Josh get the the, the most to do um, uh, out of you know our guest stars that aren't you know Ben, Hannah, Addison, etc. Um, but um, uh, uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, of course, was the the Home Alone bit that you had mentioned. I love the fact that we get this opportunity to see Ben and Hannah using their scientific ingenuity to come up with a plan to, to stop this. Um, talk a little bit about the idea to do that, to not have it be, you know, fisticuffs or whatever. I mean, obviously Ben's shoulders injured anyway. Um, and, and I just, I just love, I, I, uh, yeah, I did. I loved the plan and I love seeing them hatch the plan. I loved Jeffrey mm -hmm. being there, which I want to ask you about Jeffrey real quick before we go as well. But yeah. Uh, the decision to hatch that plot and, and have them, you know, in a trap. Where yeah, well, I mean, you've from. got two characters whose who's, who's, you know, brilliance lies in their knowledge of, of, of science and physics. And so to say, oh, we're just going to stand right outside the door and punch them in the face when they come wouldn't be true to the characters, right? <laughs> Ben's, not a, Ben's past this, right? So, like, that's the other thing. Right. Is he didn't, wouldn't want to, like, 
you know, hurt somebody unless he had to. So, so we put them in this basement with all of this, you know, GAC in there on purpose because we wanted to sort of see how will these two brilliant minds, you know, meld. And it was, it was, you know, again, like I talked very early on in our conversation about how I love writing action adventure, but I always think that the action adventure piece needs to speak to who the characters are and the characters need to be moved by or move the story in a way that feels like it's about character. And so, you know, Ben and Hannah are linked uh, sort of, you know, um, through time and space by this love story and by their sort of, um, you know, sort of quantum entanglement, as it were. Um, but how do we then show that, right? How do we see their mind melt? And it's this, so, you know, they're brainstorming down in the basement and they're having a conversation where they're finishing each other sentences and it's deliberate that Kevin has no idea what he's, what they're talking about because <laughs> they are sort of speaking to each other through, through a mind melt. And then they both come up with the rock salt idea at the same time. So it's sort of, let's, let's tell the love story through action. Let's tell the love story through yeah. watching them piece together this track. Um, and then it wouldn't be, you know, a, a good action sequence without a little bit of a fight at the end. But again, that fight, and sure. I hope this comes through, it, it was really well um, put together by our stunt team and our director and, you know, our, 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 our cinematographer, um, Anna, which was, you know, how do we tell the story of these two people who are tangled in time and, and, and love each other in a fight sequence, right? So you see them in this two-on-one sequence against this really capable fighter, but, and they're not fighters, Ben and Hannah are not fighters by nature, but because they are, right. you know, sort of thinking with one mind, they're able to double team on her and, and get one over on her. Um, and again, you have Kevin saying, are you sure you two don't know each other from before? Because <laughs> there is this sort of magic to the, to the way they come together. So all of that is by way of saying, like, when we started, we said, okay, well, we're going to set a trap home alone style. And then we tried to brainstorm about how you do that. And it's okay, it should be based in science. So we're going to use this idea that electricity conducts through the water. And then we want to make sure we're telling the love story. So we're going to see them doing it together as a team and use Kevin as the eyes into that to tell that story in a most effective way possible. Yeah. Well, it worked wonderfully. And I'm glad you brought up the fight too, because I had almost forgot about that, but I, I also thought it was a wonderful kind of uh, tip of the cap in some ways to secret history, because I love the fact that, you know, at the end of secret history, they're working together in a similar way. And now seeing mm -hmm. that again in this respect, in, it, but in a different manner uh, uh, was, was wonderful. Um, so the one big thing that I haven't really asked you about, and I haven't talked too much about. And part of that is because I feel like I immediately would want to, you know, fall into spoiler territory. Uh, uh, and, and I, I know that that's not going to happen is of course, Jeffrey and the fact that Hannah has a son and you know, that, that, that there's, that there's now someone else in play, quite frankly, who could have an impact on future events, especially considering their age. I know that, you know, one of the things that's been going around in the fandom since Hannah appeared is this notion that she's somehow going to be involved in present day events. And one of the things I've tried to remind people is like, yeah, she'd be like a hundred years old though. So like, probably not, but now quite frankly, we have someone who wouldn't be a hundred years old. Now I know you can't say anything and I don't expect you to, but with that in mind, uh, can you talk a little bit about the decision to, you, you know, it's one thing to have Hannah get married. It's another thing to have Hannah have a child and, and be a parent. You talk about the decision to, you know, to create Jeffrey and to, and to have this other character now kind of in the mix and, and what that does for the possibilities for the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you are correct that I'm going to artfully uh, or not so artfully dodge any questions about where that character is going. I, I can say that, you know, sort of emotionally, it was important to us, as we talked about before, for Hannah to have this fully realized life. And that was honestly where we started was, you know, what would it look like for her to have moved on? How do you articulate that besides just like she has some different makeup on her face and a different hairstyle is sure. we need her to have this very different looking and feeling life. And then what would what would the child of this extraordinary person be like? They wouldn't just be, you know, wanting to play Atari. They would, they would be an extraordinary <laughs> kid. So we have him, you know, knowing what the Maillard reaction is. We have him having saved serial box top for two years to get his Red Rider BB gun in our little Christmas story. Um, homage. Yeah. We have him building a hydroelectric turbine with his mother, which, you know, it's no accident that we were talking about fusion in, in 206. And here we are, you know, with yeah. another, you know, sort of energy experiment, you know, a little, a little um, nod of a cap to that. So, you know, it was a largely, um, it was lar uh, largely about emotion and sort of telling the story of Hannah's moving on and then showing that the child of Hannah would be as extraordinary as she is. Um, and beyond that, I, I sure. plead the fifth. 
Um, maybe I'll come back on the podcast after two thirteen, and we can discuss. More. I, 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 yes, I would love that. Um, so, last couple of questions, and then I'll let you get out of here. I really appreciate you sharing your time with me. Of is um, one uh, firmly tongue in cheek, but I'm just curious: when did you have a high school named after you? <laughs> Most <laughs> to have high school named after me. Usually, you have to do something extraordinary and die to do that. I mean, honestly, a lot of this is, uh, you know, the fun of putting your friends' names in the show. That I did not intend to put my name in the show. Like I said, the. Uh, they, uh, I think we talked about this before we got online, but the art department yeah. had the idea that, that Josh went to Alexander Berger High School, which is a little tiny little Easter egg planted in the episode. <laughs> but, um, but no, it's always fun to be able to shout out to your friends. Kevin Zat is a, is a shout out to a friend of mine um, who is an enormous uh, QL fan and, and like live texts Aww. me every time the show is nice. on. Um, and, uh, you know, there's little little Easter eggs here and there, Hannah and Allie being one, and um, you know, to friends and family all around the world. You know, that's one of the nice things when you're a writer is you get to to include your friends in there, and, and you know, occasionally your enemies if you want if you want to put a good <laughs> one in there. Um, but um, but yeah, that was just a, a fun little wink. But I I cannot take credit for the Alexander Berg High School. That was our, our wonderful art department. Yeah, they are incredible. There's no doubt about that. I mean, the work that they do on the show is magnificent, especially considering the creating a new world every week. Yeah, it's a huge task. What do you hope people take away from this episode? I, you know, I think it's largely, a, you know, a question of how do you exist in this unique world that Ben is put into? And he's, he, this is a show that gets to tell a story that no other show gets to tell, which is about a man who is you know a nomad in the universe traveling through time and space helping people um and living this entirely selfless existence he started to do it for selfless reasons to save the woman that he loved and now he's potentially stuck out in the world and how does he how does he exist like that can he, can he be in love with somebody who's going to have her own life um does he have to be entirely selfless or can he make decisions that are about himself what does he do when it comes time to you know help the people that he loves even if it's outside of the balance of the leap um, so those are all sort of the emotional questions. And then, you know, honestly, like I, I write television that I hope people will just enjoy and, and have fun with. Yeah. And so I hope, you know, you sit back and watch this one and have a, have a good ride, you know, it, it, while, while still falling in love with our characters and, and feeling delighted by the situations they go in. Well, you got to write a car chase that has, in my opinion, some sparkling dialogue uh, along with it, ending in a fantastic accident. Uh, so, so yeah, right there, I mean, <laughs> when I knew I was writing the mid-season premiere, Martin told me, write it big. And I said, well, <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'll write it to be like, you know, significantly more expensive than I know we can afford. And then I'll cut stuff when we get there, assuming that we would either cut the car chase or jumping out of the bus or right. you know the, the fight at the end, and yet because we have this incredible um, production team and a director who was really experienced, and actors who were game for anything, and you know producers who were really smart, we were able to fit it all in. We didn't cut a single piece of action out of the episode, so that was that was a delight. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, it feels like a big episode and it is a very fun episode. Um, and, it, you know, in addition to, of course, it, it's funny because I was thinking to myself as I was rewatching it, you know, Hannah doesn't come in, like I said, until about halfway through the episode. And I, I wondered for a moment, I just, in my head, I wanted to picture an episode where Hannah never comes in. And I was like, yeah, I mean, the, the episode would still have like it would still have story to tell and places to go, which I think is really wonderful and uh, and speaks to the to the quality and the, and the way that I was enjoying the episode anyway. But then, of course, when you inject her into it now, it's just sort of like, you know, business just picked up, uh, which is great. Um, nice. Last question for you. Um, and this is just kind of a general one that I've started asking people. Uh, Eliza was the first person that I asked this to. Uh, but what inspires you? Creatively or just in general? Both. <laughs> um you know, for me as a writer, I actually, you know, love the process of it. You know, like I, I love taking, you know, as this episode is an example, there's something really magical to me about having a conversation with Martin on the phone where he says, what if Ben comes to handcuff to someone all the way <laughs> to, we have a team of 200 extraordinary artisans pouring their heart and soul into making that. You know, it yeah. starts as a sentence and it ends up as, you know, uh, this massive production um, that ultimately boils down to 42 minutes of entertainment for somebody as they're sitting there at home trying to unwind at the end of the day, <laughs> but was a real labor of love for everybody from, you know, the craft services team to the wardrobe department to, you know, the art department, hair and makeup, like everybody is really pouring their soul into making something really beautiful and perfect. 
Um, yeah. And every line of dialogue is thought through by an actor in a really um, deep and profound way. And every camera shot is thought through by our cinematography team and our camera department. Um, you know, every sound decision is, is, is really poured over, um, you know, to, the, to within an inch of a, of a frame, um, all from something that, that started as a kernel of a thought, you know, and built uh, with the writer's room, built as a script, built through the editorial process with a studio and a network. And so that, to me, is really inspirational, is just watching that process happen. That's why I love television. Absolutely. I think that's a wonderful answer. It's, I mean, it's the reason why I love, you know, performing arts in general, because I, I feel mm -hmm. the same way about live theater. You know, we just opened a show yeah, on Saturday 100%. night and it's, you know, it's the, it's the, that same feeling. And, uh, that's, I love that. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so, so much for coming on the show and for, for sharing and being here. It really is always a pleasure. I, I had so much fun talking to you last time and I'm glad that we got to do it again and, and, you know, for, for off the Thanks cuff. for your passion for the show and, and, uh, for putting so much thought into it. It's always been such a joy listening to you and, uh, and now talking to you and hopefully we have many more to come. I hope so too. I hope so too. All right. Well, we're going to get out of here. Uh, thank you so much, fellow travelers and uh, stay tuned. There will certainly be more coming up. If you haven't already, you can check out my review of the episode on the YouTube channel or uh, audio only version uh, podcast and Apple podcasts, wherever you get your podcast. Um, but uh, we'll be back next week, of course, uh, talking, talking more quantum leap. And there's a lot yet to come as we get into these final five episodes.